All right. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to our Serious Angler podcast. As always, I'm your host, Bailey Eichbrett, and joined with me is my co-host and the captain, Mr. Andy Full. And welcome to another Monday Night Live presented by Queen Tackle. Uh, something that we haven't plugged in a while, Andrew, that came up kind of big for I shouldn't say big because we didn't do anything productive this past weekend, but we caught a lot of fish. And that Queen Tackle flipping jig yeah. stuck a lot of freaking fish. Dude, oh, my, my thumbs... I think we're still bleeding this morning from so how many fish we caught this weekend. It was just dumb. Just and no big ones. No big ones. Like, what the heck is yeah. up with that? We, over two days, Andrew and I had a two-day tournament this past weekend, and we did not do very well in terms of standings. Uh, I would very confidently say we caught the most fish out By of everybody. Far. Uh, not that that's much of an accomplishment because weight wise, it was just bad. We just literally caught every single fish was between two and three pounds and not a single giant, which like everyone that was on the first spectrum of like, they had little to like, they had maybe 10 to 15 bites a day, but they had like four pounders mixed in and they were throwing the exact same thing. We were around areas that we were. And I, I we just had so many bites. We caught probably over a hundred fish within the two days. We had a riot doing it cause you're cracking fish in the face and flipping grass. And, but I don't think, dude, I don't think we lost a single fish on a jig. No. I think the only fish we lost were either on a drop shot or a frog. I lost that one under a dock, Texas rig Senko, which I don't know how. The hook yeah, was I, like I buried. Know. Oh, Andrew's frozen on my end. But. Basically, it was a uh, it was a rough weekend for us. It was a, a two day tournament out on uh, our local trail, the Western New York Bassmasters. And oh, there you go, you're back. Yeah, I don't uh, know what happened. That was weird. That was weird. But uh, I was like, already exhausted going into day one on Saturday. It was like a crazy drive getting to uh, obviously Sodus Bay, Western New York Bassmasters. But like Thursday, Friday, I had the open on Oneida which was probably the worst two days of fishing I've ever had in my entire life. Wind was blowing like a mother both days. So like, obviously it was brutal, like on your body, but like I caught one fish on day one for two fifteen, <laughs> And I was in like, I think I was in, I was like 92nd or something like that on day one. And then day two, I caught two fish that were smaller than my one fish on day one. And I think Killer. I was like, and I moved up. And I moved up on day two. It was just straight killer. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. And and day two was kind of fun because it got paired up with my buddy, Destin Demarion, who was literally my travel partner. We both got the text after day one. We're like, no way. We just got paired up. <laughs> so we had an absolute ball of a day. But, like, it sucked. <laughs> like, it sucked so bad. We did everything under the sun and just could not buy us a bite. Like, it was bad. I don't know what exactly happened, but just the fish were... Fish weren't where they were supposed to be, but That's the way it goes it's all good. Sometimes. But here we are. We're now we are now on Monday Night Live, back to fishing, talking fishing, and obviously we have a really cool show lined up tonight with Stephen Estes. And uh, stay tuned for after the show because Andrew and I got some hints to drop to you guys because we have some massive, massive news coming. Uh, biggest news we've had since I've brought on Andrew as a co-host. Yep. Uh, things that are going to take this this podcast to, to new heights, new levels. We are beyond excited about it. So we're excited to share with you. So we're going to drop some hints afterwards. Make sure you guys stick around. Obviously, this is going to be some some sick information that you guys are going to get from Steve. So I think without further ado, Andrew, we should bring yeah, him on here on. and introduce Mr. Steve. What's going on, dude? Hey, guys. How's it going tonight? Yeah, good. How is old New Hampshire treating you right now? Oh, pretty good. Weather's cool. Can't complain. So appreciate you guys having me on tonight. Yeah. There's, there's always that one week, like in like late August, where it gets really cold, and I feel like it's like a month ahead. Yeah, it was like 50 degrees the other night. Ooh. It was beautiful. I loved it. <laughs> it felt like yeah. fall again. So uh, rabbit hole here. It got down to like 51 degrees in our cabin. Well, it was 51 degrees outside, and the one guy we we're staying with in like the little house. Turn the air down to 62. And Bailey was like in two hoodies with three blankets on him on the couch, shivering because he was, I was so not cold. Shivering. Oh, you were shivering. <laughs> I was not shivering for one. And two, I was loving it because I love to sleep in the cold. I can't sleep when it's 80 degrees outside. 
It was just funny. I'm the only one that can't sleep when I'm sweating. No, never. It's just <laughs> I I love cold like cool weather. 50, 65. Sign me up if it if it was like that all year round, I would be game. So like Steve, are you a, are you a warm weather guy or a cold weather guy? Uh, I guess I can go either way. I lived down in Alabama for a couple of years, so I, I know what the hot weather's like. So oh, man, no thing. I can do a week, but that's about it. And then I get sick of it. I just it, get mad. Not bad, but <laughs> sweatshirt weather. That's not a bad thing. Yeah. Well, dude, before we get too deep in the show here, for those who may not know you, explain a little bit about yourself and then uh, let's dive into kind of how you got started bass fishing in the first place and kind of that tourney timeline. Yeah, so uh, my name's Steve Estes. I'm, I live in uh, Auburn, New Hampshire. Um, I spend, you know, majority of my time fishing up on Lake Champlain. I don't, I don't do a whole lot of local fishing around here. Um, just I, I've kind of, I started fishing Champlain like 12 years ago, and just that was ruined after I started going up there. And it just kind of, you know, that that's the only place I wanted to go after that. We got some great stuff here in New Hampshire, but it's certainly by far my favorite place to go. Um, and then as, as far as like getting started into fishing, um, I, I mean, my dad got me into fishing before I could even walk. So I, I've been back in a trailer up since I was 10 years old and, you know, out on the boat constantly. So it, there's no question where I got it from. <laughs> That's awesome. So when did, uh, when did the tournament start? How old were you? Um, I think we've, I was probably like. 15 or 16 i know waivers had to be signed for me to fish my first tournament so oh. it was pretty young lots of lots of frustration from my dad at that age lots of backlashes and <laughs> kicked rod <laughs> over the side of the boat stuff like that but uh, oh, man. I, I couldn't be more thankful for him to get me into it i mean it's you know i've, I've just been eat up with it since the, the first day i ever went awesome. Heck yeah so then you know from there you know, obviously you probably got your, your first own boat, you know, first to you and then kind of got into some tournament trails. So kind of like what led you to then, were you, were you cherry picking the Toyota or did you kind of lead up to it and kind of trying to get into this, you know, triple A league of, of bass fishing? I mean, I started off, you know, fishing club tournaments and stuff like that. I lived down in Massachusetts for a lot of my life. Um, so I would, I would fish the South Shore Bassmasters down there. Um, and, and I, I became friends with a lot of guys around there and, and just kind of evolved from there. And, and I got kind of sick of fishing Massachusetts. I mean, it's a lot of like 200 to five acre puddles, I call them. And you basically just take a, a deli ticket, you know, <laughs> and rotate the spots, the docks, the grass lines. And I just knew that wasn't for me. And I had to get out of there and, and fish some real water. And I see a lot of guys get caught up in that. And they get comfortable winning their, their ABAs and club tournaments down there. And I, I just knew that wasn't for me. Uh, I mean, I never in a million years saw myself winning a, a Toyota event like this, especially, you know, only at 32. But um, I, I just said I was going to go for it one day. I forget how old I was. I think I fished my first Toyota. I don't know. I, was, I had to be in my early 20s. Um, and I think I cashed a check in that one and I got all confident and I, I came back and fished another one. I did well the first day and then waited in three fish the second day and, and oh. realized I wasn't as good as I thought, you know. <laughs> But I just was never scared to go fish bigger tournaments. I guess I just, I, I, I didn't care if I got embarrassed. I wasn't going to ride on anybody's coattail. I just wanted to do my own thing and, and try to compete with the best guys up here. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think so you said something kind of, that kind of resonated with me for a, a bit there, is the, how important it can be to not be afraid to suck. Like so many people are afraid of seeing them, their names down in the bottom of the standings or having a bad day. And th sometimes that kind of is why guys will do bad in a tournament or what will kind of stray guys away from tournament fishing where they might be a great tournament angler, but they're so afraid of sucking in a tournament that they won't actually fish it or they won't fish it correctly because they're too afraid of doing bad versus fishing to their capabilities. So is that some, kind of something? Overthink. Yeah. Is that something you're just kind of, you just like to fish free, you don't really care, just kind of go out and just, and catch them up? Or is it just like, is, it, is mentality one of your strengths? Um, I don't know that mentality is. I mean, I still get nervous as heck going into big tournaments, and, and it's not like I'm always super confident going into a tournament. Um, 
I, I haven't traveled around and fished different places as much as I should and gotten out of that comfort zone. But a lot of that just is because of work and family and all that. Um, it's not like a fear of doing it. It's just we, we live in a strange area, too. We're, we're pretty far away from all the big tournament lakes. I mean, there's some good stuff in New York, I guess. But, um, you know, you got to drive six to eight hours to get to any bigger tournaments other mm-hmm. than Champlain. And that's why I chose to fish Champlain was because it was the closest place where you could get that hundred plus boat field you know there's just nowhere else that's reasonably close i mean you can go to st lawrence but that wasn't st lawrence wasn't really a thing back when i first started tournament fishing you know so yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that place is definitely exploding popularity. yeah I, I just was never scared to go suck i guess it, it just didn't matter that was never a thought that crossed my mind i mean we're all human right we're just normal normal guys out fishing and we're gonna suck there's no doubt even the best of the best hmm. yeah and I think that's one thing you hear from some of the best guys that are on the pedestals now is you can't be afraid of, you know, tanking a tournament because it's got one, it's going to happen to everybody. You can't one, you can't win every one. You can't top five every single one. You know, you're going to have bad tournaments, but you got to be able to mentally learn from that tournament and kind of recognize where you went wrong. And then there's going to be tournaments where you're like, you'd made the right decisions and the fish just weren't there because that's a variable that we cannot control. I mean, that's what a lot of guys just, what, what's cooler than sucking in a tournament. You know, you see a lot of these pro guys, some of the best guys in the country that they'll suck in the tournament. And they'll come right back out and get a top 10 or something. I mean, that, that to me is more impressive than anything. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like great. they just whitewash it. They're like, we're done on to the next one. I was that much money on the line and your livelihood. That's gotta be so hard to do bouncing from big tournament to big tournament and not doing well. Yeah. I yeah. Can't, I'm having that much on the line, you know, and just, just being like, Oh, let's move on to the next one and go work on getting another check. Yeah. And, and that's, and that's a, geez, it's a can of worms that is like for a whole other show where you can talk about how important it is to have sponsors and contracts and non-endemic sponsors and how important that can be to being more you know fishing more mentally free in tournaments when you're not worrying about cashing a check you can know that you're going to get through the season tournament or not and be able to go after a win versus trying to worry about paying getting grocery money for the next tournament it's that's a whole nother can of worms that we can go into at a later date but i think right now and, and more importantly i would love to hear kind of leading up to champlain what was going through your head how practice went and then leading into day one so um, this, the practice going into this Toyota series was different than any other event I've ever fished on Champlain, whether it was a club tournament, an ABA, or whatever, you know, from the smallest to the biggest. I've never, I've never felt this confident going into a tournament. And that's not something that I don't like. I'm not bragging. I, I didn't tell. There's, there's like two people I told that going into this tournament, maybe three. And uh, I, I, when my dad was one of them and I, I just told him, I said, dad, I, I think something special is about to happen here. Like I, I, I've never been on this, this good of a group of fish, you know? And, uh, I think what really gave me the confidence was I went back and checked those fish like five or six different times. And I've never done that before, I guess, cause I've, I've never felt like I was on enough fish that I needed to keep checking them like that. And I got to check it in all different conditions, you know, no wind, heavy wind, different directions, sun, clouds, you know, and, and they, they bit every time I went to them. And I, I just, awesome. I knew at that point it was something, cause I think every time that I stopped on them in practice, I caught a four pounder. So, I mean, that just doesn't happen on Champlain. I mean, there's a lot of four pounders, but you don't just pull up anywhere and catch a four pounder, <laughs> you know? So uh, I definitely had more confidence going into that tournament than, than I've ever had in the past. Yeah, a four pounder on Champlain, nonetheless, is one to, to one to take very seriously. Yeah, <laughs> you, you hit that 372 mark, that 378, that 385. I mean, that that's a good one. You want you might need one or two of those in your limit, but when you can when you can put one on that Rapala scale and it says, you know, 4.25 or something like that. I mean, that's you know, game changer tournament winning fish. Yeah, yeah. So that Saturday, you brought. Almost twenty two, right? It was twenty one fifteen. Yeah. Yeah, and were those all brown, or did you have some green mixed in? I didn't weigh in a single uh, green fish the whole tournament. It was all awesome. so badass. <laughs> so, I, 
actually never even went and fished for largemouth. I had I had several areas, probably like four to six milfoil grass beds that actually had some really good quality largemouth. But I just felt between the elites being there and then the Toyota series, I just didn't. I, there was just too many fish where I was at, and they were the right size, and I just there was no way I could leave them. It, it, obviously, it was the right plan. So, yeah, yeah. it's phenomenal. Yeah. So this area where you had your fish, is it something that you kind of stuck around all day long or did you kind of have some plan B plan C stuff where you probably, you probably bounced to your first, your primary area first thing. And then do you have anything that you would check to relocate or were you sitting on these fish from start to finish? So, I mean, I had, I had plan B, C, D, E, F, you know what I mean? And, and I felt like not, not necessarily I could get 20 pounds off those other plans, but I, I had caught four pounders pretty easily off them in practice. And, um, I, I just, I went to that first area on day one and I think I weighed like 19, 14 or something like that. And it, and it wasn't instant. Like I didn't catch almost 20 pounds just right away. I mean, there was a lot of upgrading going on. So uh, but I, I knew they were there. I mean, live sonar has just changed the game. It, it shows you what's there, and there's no secrets. So I, I knew there was enough fish there to hold up for the next day. And, and then I went back the next day and didn't didn't have quite as big of a bag. I think I had like 19 and a quarter or 19 and a half, something like that. And uh, But it was also windy those first couple of days, and it, it makes it hard to stay on those fish when it's windy. I mean, I was targeting individual fish, so you've really got to drop that bait right on top of them to get them to bite. And uh, that's not that easy to do. It wasn't like ridiculously windy, but you know, it was foot and a half, two foot waves. So, um, and, and that's when it all came together on day three. I was, I was super nervous going into day three thinking, you know, it's going to be flat calm. We haven't really, I mean, I think I had a half a day in practice where it was like that, but I was nervous cause I felt, I felt like that wind really had them fired up and, I pulled up on the spot and I I caught like a two and a half pounder on the first cast and it was just game on from there. Um, I had 19 pounds by like eight o'clock in the morning. (laughs) Can't beat that. No, No. (laughs) That's when you know a plan is working. (laughs) Incredible. Yeah. Yeah. So for, for those tuning in right now, we're talking with Steve Estes about his uh, Toyota series win on Lake Champlain and I'm kind of curious, one, the system you're running for, for forward facing, and two, were these fish you think were, they were just resident fish, or were these fish that were, you know, was it a highway kind of spot where these fish are on their way to something else, or are these fish coming and going? What was it kind of set up as without exposing I, your spot? I really don't know all the details of, of when they got there, how long they're going to be there. You know, I, I don't know that yet because it's all new to me. I mean, this is a completely new area that I've never fished before on Champlain. and oh, Even better. So, I mean, it, it was just a crazy spot that was off the wall, and I felt like nobody else was going to find it. And um, I just – i they're on bait. I mean, there's no question they're following the bait around. But I don't know how long that bait's going to stay there. Um you know, I don't know if it's going to be good for three weeks, a month, the whole summer. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, from from experience in the past on Champlain, it seems like they, the bigger fish move to the isolated boulders and stuff as we get into August and September. So I would I would anticipate a lot of those fish are probably going to leave that area. I, I mean, my best guess is they're, they leave after the spawn and probably congregate there and just kind of recoup themselves. And nobody's ever went and <laughs> bashed them on the head with a drop shot. You know what I mean? And too right. easy. You know, I think they were just, they were in their little safe haven out there and I came and blew it up. <laughs> Here I am. Here's Steve. Yeah. <laughs> this guy's back again, but <laughs> we got to eat what he's throwing because it's yummy. It's like the type deal. It's just funny. And so, they didn't, they didn't all bite. You know what I mean? It's not yeah. every drop I was catching a fish. I mean, you had to, to mess with some of them, especially the bigger ones, but then other times they acted extremely dumb and would just go chew it you know as soon as it got anywhere near them so i I find it fascinating fascinating the attitude of each individual smallmouth like a largemouth they all kind of relatively act the same they just feed they're lazy they sit there something comes by they eat it usually but um with smallmouth each into in each individual fish is so temperamental on like each side of the spectrum it's crazy in my opinion i see it with eerie fish all the time like You'll drop on them. One will be suspended. It'll follow your drop shot right down. And the next one won't even look at it. You can actually kind of see it swim away on 2D. 
in the right. same school. Right. So it's just wild. Yeah, and they're they're very competitive too. You know, if you it, that that's usually the trick. Although I, I say that, but the bigger fish that I typically caught were usually by theirself. But you don't get nearly as many bites chasing those individual ones. Mm -hmm. But if there's two or three of them together, they're gonna eat it. It's just whether you you get the hook in them or not. I mean, they they can't stand it when there's competition around. Right. That's so. This goes back to my theory, and I feel like this is like the hundredth time I brought this up on this podcast. But I had on Benjamin Nowak, a good buddy of ours, a while ago. We talked about this theory of you can have decent bags of smallmouth when you fish the schools, but if you want to catch a giant, you got to get off the school because it's most likely going to be by itself because of territorial. And that kind of almost reinforces that theory of like, if you go look for individual fish, chances are they're going to be those bigger, more mature fish. And that's just, it was just really cool to hear you say that. Like, you got to get off that school if you're going to catch one that was big. If it was by itself, chances are it's going to be a bigger fish, one that's probably going to stay in your bag. Um, but I'm kind of curious, and you don't have to obviously give it up if you got any juice that you want to keep to yourself, but how are you catching these fish, like bait-wise, presentation, whole, whole nine yards? There, there is no secrets there. I mean, I was using a, a hog pours, hand poured custom uh, hog teaser drop shot bait. And I, I was just switching the color up, rotating it. Um, anything with an iridescent belly with kind of that pearl belly to it, I feel like uh, imitates a perch. So I, I would just try different baits. And um, I had a pack of flatworms. Everybody talks about flatworms, right? Flatworms are the greatest thing ever to be made. And, and uh, I, I just, I, I wanted to test that theory in the tournament. So I dropped the flatworm down because I wasn't getting bit. And first cast, he, he eats it. And I'm like, oh my God, it's really the bait. <laughs> I didn't get another bite after that. And then every other fish, he wasn't even in my limit, but every other fish was on that hog teaser. So I, I just think it's it's the right color and the right presentation to him. Um, and I'm just throwing it on a, a drop shot with a half ounce Eco Pro tungsten weight on it. Um, and, and that's every single fish I weighed in was on that setup. So what what brand bait is this? It's uh, it's a guy out of Wisconsin. He's just a small, you know, he doesn't have any, he's not Berkeley or anything like that, but he'll, he'll basically make you any color you want. His business is called Hog Pours Custom Baits. His Hog first name is Randy, right? Yeah, Randy Burton. Yeah, yeah. yeah I've, I've fished his baits before. A guy here is good friends with randy so i saw your bait and i i actually messaged randy and i bought some instantly because i was like <laughs> that color will smash him on yeah, Erie. It, so it, he's awesome i mean i didn't have any ties to randy at all i just you know how they put up posts on facebook with yeah stuff i mean that's how i bought his baits and i just i couldn't get enough of them after that and he was i'd bring a color to him and a week or two later they were on my doorstep and he doesn't mess around like these aren't just some half-ass you know they're good. I, he he can imitate anything you want, and they just flat out catch them. They don't even stink that much. They don't have a strong scent, but the fish just love them, and they're now, salt. They have quite a bit of salt on them, though, don't they? If I remember correctly, I haven't had some in a while. So, yeah. yeah. And, Does he have a website? Uh, he he operates more off of Facebook than a website. Facebook? You, okay. you type that in H A W G. I'll forward it to you, Bailey. I have it on my phone. I got I got the Facebook page. I wanted to put it in the chat here for anyone else. We wanna we wanna make Steve look good to uh to his guys here. So we put it in the the chat comments if you guys wanna get a link to go get some of these. It, it was pretty juicy yeah, the tournament. He was we messaged almost every day and he's like, Oh, it's slowed down and then an hour later he's like, You bastard, it's going again. <laughs> <You know? laughs> he was spending two, three hours responding to the messages and pouring baits late at night and it, it was really cool. I, I was great I was really happy to be a part of that and help him. You know, I mean, it's not his sole income by any means, but to, to give him that little extra plug was was really cool because he's not he's just a really humble, nice guy. Yeah, he responded to me. He goes, well, I'll let you know when they're ready. I got a lot of orders here. <laughs> I was like no rush. Yeah, I don't think he's ever had that many orders at once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's awesome awesome. to hear. It, it's that kind of like it goes back to this whole like when you hear companies or guys talk about it, it was like a. You know, it's a team win like companies you know sponsors especially like on how your relationship is with them they win when you win like and that's why companies like see importance of partnering with anglers because for that exact reason you know steve like you did so well on this bait 
you want a Toyota series, people see that and go, oh, crap, I need some of those. And then, therefore, now you're bringing a win to, to Randy. So that's what's really kind of cool. We were, we were talking offline here about this industry and kind of how everything intertwines and connects and how everyone kind of works with each other. And that's one that I think has been old as time is companies win with their anglers. You know, if you have a successful angler, chances are you're going to have a successful either one bait that sells out like crazy, like the flatworms did after Justin Lucas and Bertrand and them crushed on Erie. You know, hog pours is, is selling out right now because if you went on Lake Champlain. And that's yeah, what's pretty cool to see. cool to bring him that business, you know what I mean? And I, I proved myself that those flatworms, you know, the, those hog pours will catch them just as much as those flatworms will. And and that that's what's really cool about his baits. They just work. I've, I've fished a lot of custom hand poured baits and some of them, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's the scent, the, the how hard the plastic is, they just don't bite it, you know, but I've never had a problem catching fish with his baits. That's pretty cool. It, it kind of, it was cool because... Let me see if I actually bring it up here. I think I have a picture. Actually, I think I have it. There we go. Let me see if I can share screen here. Bring up your post. Because it's not like it's a crazy bait shape. You know, it's it's a relatively like familiar drop shot bait. But like, like you mentioned, that belly. And it kind of makes it more look like a perch. I think that's what's kind of interesting. It's it's a, it's an interesting subject to kind of go down of like how certain colors look at certain depths and to fish and kind of how they see it. But I'm just very curious. But real quick, talk to us. Um, talk to us about your drop shot setup, like hook, line. I know you mentioned you were you using a yeah rod reel. Your Eco Pro tungsten. You're throwing a half ounce. Kind of talk to us about you know what hook you're using and all that jazz. Yeah, so um, I, I throw it on a hammer rods, drop shot rod. They make a 6.9 drop shot rod. They put, you know, specific guides and space them a certain amount away just for a drop shot rod. And um, I've been using that rod for a couple, two or three years now. Um, and I've just had great luck with it. I just feel like it's super sensitive and, and, and just perfect setup. Um, and I throw that with a 10-pound vicious no-fade braid. Um, I came across that stuff last year, I think, and I got so sick of trying every brand out there for braid and they would all fade. And you'd have to change them out. And um, that no fade braid, it, it stands true to its name. I mean, I never I don't have to change it out at all during the season. Like, hmm. I, I really could go two years with it if I wanted to. Um, oh, that's awesome. And so it's it's not cheap, but it's, it's worth every penny because you're not constantly changing the line out. You know what I mean? And uh, I put the uh, eight pound cigar um tattoo fluorocarbon leader on it and then as far as the hook i mixed it up i didn't i, I didn't really have any loyalty to any kind of hook um i was throwing i think an owner at the beginning of, and i just felt like i was losing a lot of fish with that so i switched to a trocar and it, it seemed to be better it still wasn't perfect but it seemed to be better so um i definitely stayed buttoned up more with that trocar and, and then i had that uh all weighted down with the half ounce eco pro full contact drop shot weight uh, tungsten drop shot weight so um you know that that the way they've designed that weight i just feel like i'm in constant contact with the bottom and the the biggest thing that i think most people don't realize and, and i probably didn't realize it before live sonar is there's so many times that that fish picks up the bait and you don't even know it i mean those those big smallies will pick that bait up and just come straight up and then all of a sudden there's just nothing there and you're like oh crap and just reel as fast as you can you know and, and i was catching a lot of them way out in front of the boat too and I'd, I'd even have to just watch my rod tip because they were so far out in front of the boat i just couldn't feel it because it, it hmm. was so far away so uh, i i feel like having that constant contact though definitely helps that's such an interesting deal were you were you catching these? Or are you watching them on forward facing when you were kind of like targeting these fish or was it like a specific area that you were, you now was it more of a 360 kind of bite or was it more of like a pan optics kind of bite? No, this, this, I actually didn't even have a 360 on the boat. It was just a uh, Lowrance active target. So oh, okay. I was just going after individual fish. There was no, there was no waypoint I was on, some magic waypoint, anything like that. I mean, I was just following. I was letting the active target take me where the fish were. Was there certain areas that seemed more key? Yeah, definitely. But 
I felt like I could roam anywhere around there and catch fish because you can see them. I mean, I was seeing them out to 120 feet out in front of the boat. Sure. Hmm. And that's that's a big reason why I lost a lot of fish because I would see them 100 feet out. And if you can drop it on their head 100 feet out, they bite it, I, I don't know, probably 90% of the time. But it's, it's hard to hit a fish on the head at 100. I mean, you really can't cast any further than 100 feet, according to Active Target. I mean, that was winding up and throwing it as far as I could. And, I mean, when a four pound smallie comes up out of 30 feet straight up at 100 feet out, I mean, you just don't it's have ever good. <laughs> <laughs> but on the flip side, I, I maybe not have got that fish to bite. So I was willing to take the chance. I mean, I think I probably lost more fish on day one than most people got bites. I mean, it was just insane. I, I've never lost that many fish. But on the flip side, I caught a ton too. So mm -hmm. hmm. yeah, that's true. I mean, did you, so throughout the tournament, did, is there any adjustments that you made or did that spot rel relatively stay true to, you know, your finish? So I tried, to, I tried a few different things. You know, I tried a Ned rig. I tried a spy bait. Um, they, they would hit the spy bait, but I, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get any of the big ones on the spy bait. So um, I mainly just stuck to the drop shot. I, I did on day two rotate my area. I had a, somebody come out on me about 40 or 50 yards from me. And uh, I, I didn't really understand what that was all about. So I, I, don't, I get a little frustrated when people come out in the wide open like that. So I decided to just pack up and leave, which was probably crazy at the <laughs> looking back at it. But um, I picked up and left and I actually caught a uh, four and a quarter and a four on the next spot that I stopped. So... I mean, that was, that was, that right was huge for my confidence. Like I knew, you know, a lot of people talked about one, my one magical spot after this tournament. And I, I got kind of sick of hearing that everybody magical spot, magical spot. And I mean, I had a lot more than one magical spot. Like I felt like I could have won that tournament in four, four different areas. So That's to, awesome. to pull off of that and go catch those two over four was a huge, huge boost to my confidence. And, and I actually didn't even catch those fish in a waypoint. I just went and found them. Hmm. in the middle of the day two on the toyota i mean that i mean I, I just couldn't boost my confidence any more than that let's just go ran this run this random thing that looks good on the <laughs> map due to contours and let's go catch a couple <laughs> yeah i mean when things like that work i mean i, don't, I just feel like you can't do any wrong you know that that right. just happened in a tournament but i, I right. it was a reflection of my practice too because I, I did do a lot of that i wasn't trying to focus on waypoints i was relocating fish every day and I, there's not there's not many guys that can have that much confidence in their electronics i'm not saying that i'm anybody special using my electronics but you have to learn to fully trust your electronics when it comes to smallmouth oh yeah and, and that's kind of something that we're going to lead into here is you know finding these summer smallies because they can be such a pain to one find in the first place and then two you know relocate because they are going to leave because they are much more nomadic especially in the summer months but i'm kind of curious so like when you when you have these areas is this something where you see on the map then you're just going to go and fish it or are you going to go and gonna get on your graph side images uh side image this 2d you know are you graphing this before you fish it to see if there's something that interests you or are you just going to get up i'm going to cast around use my active target see if fish are here and then fish yeah, so I mean, typically in the in the summertime, I would be looking for a lot of rock and stuff like that, and then relying heavily on side imaging. But this time, I was more so relying on two D sonar and down imaging, um, you know, because I was finding pods of bait. But you can't necessarily, unless they're really loaded up in the bait, you can't necessarily see the smallies in that bait. You know, if there's only one here, one there. Um, so that down imaging allowed me to, to see those rice grains and see, okay, they are there. And, and then even if you have any question, you're not, your strong suits, not 2d and down imaging. Once you drop that active target down there, there's no question. I mean, it takes all the guesswork out. I mean, you don't necessarily know hundred percent at small mouth, but it's not too hard to figure out once you spend a little time there. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, obviously congratulations again on the win. My last question on Lake Champlain before we start talking just straight summer smallmouth is uh, at what point, I know you said you had a feeling, right? You were talking to your dad that you had a feeling that this tournament could kind of go your way. But was there a moment during the tournament before the end, obviously, when you were given that trophy that you kind of had, you know, there's this moment where you're like, I'm going to win this thing. Yeah, I felt, I felt like that moment came with about, 
an hour and a half left on day three, I guess. Um, I started getting these weird roller coasters of emotions that I've never had before. Just, you know, you start getting cold chills and you go, I'm in a 150 plus boat tournament or however many 200 boat tournament, you know, and, and I'm sitting in contention to win this thing. And I got almost 22 pounds sitting in my live well. I mean, somebody's really going to have to jack them. And I called a, a 385 with a 440. And that's kind of that moment when I was like, all right, this Oof. is going to happen. Like somebody's really going to have to jack them, you know, and, and, you know, Brian thrift was leading that tournament. And I mean, you know, I'm just an average guy. I'm no pro. I'm no big, big shot. You know what I mean? I'm just an average guy like the rest of us who likes to go fishing and, and uh, to be going up against that guy on stage and standing next to him at the weigh in tanks. I mean, and there's a couple, there was a few local hammers in there too. Obviously, you got to worry about Brian LaBelle and those guys. But um, standing next to him in the way in line with a 22 pound sack sitting in the tank and, and he's got 16. I mean, that's <laughs> that's a pretty cool feeling that I'll, I'll never forget. Uh, now, did he see your bag at all and be like, whoo? Or was he like super cool and quiet behind the scenes? No, he was a super nice laid back guy. I mean, I'd never met him before, but he, he was a really nice guy. We all kind of talked in the way in line, the top 10. So I knew where I stood. Matt Becker had a big bag. He had 20 something pounds. Uh, he had like a almost six pound small mouth. Oh, geez. But I knew, you know, I had weighed every one of my fish. So I knew, I thought I had 21 and a half and uh, I knew unless like Brian LaBelle, who's one of the local sticks up there, unless he had 23 pounds, I knew, you know, I didn't think one of those other guys had that big of a bag. Hmm. Now, now my That's question awesome. for you is why are the smallmouth seeming to get bigger every year at Champlain? What is the dynamic there for their like instant growth over the last five years? So I, I mean, I honestly, I'm not going to sit here and try to pretend like I know. I, I have no idea. I mean, all I can tell you is there's enough perch in that lake where I feel, I mean, it's just, there's so many. I mean, at one point my active target, you know, I had it 120 feet out and from 30 feet down to the surface and 120 feet out was nothing but perch. And I mean, when you see a school of perch like that, it's just, it's, I mean, I, that's gotta be why they're big. I mean, the seagulls were sitting out there picking off the perch as they'd come up and spit them up. I mean, there's just that many perch. Almost every fish I caught spit up a, a four to eight inch perch. Oof. Which would have been. Eight those. inch perch is like. <laughs> yeah. It's no joke. <laughs> that's like taco size. Yeah. Now I'm hungry. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Pretty long just on them spitting perch up <laughs> or more <laughs> luckily they spit them up in the live well all right so kind of transitioning to just straight summer smallmouth do you kind of have a process of you know take champlain for example other I'm not saying that there's lakes really alike champlain it's kind of one of a kind but you know just in general of smallmouth lakes in the summer uh, I love that it just froze on Andrew's face as he was drinking his beer, so he was chugging for a few seconds. Um, but uh, do you kind of have a process to kind of go out and find these things? Like, do you have a, a deal where you're going to go spend a certain amount of time graphing for them? Is there certain things you want to see first before you even fish? You know, what kind of goes through your head in the summer months when you're going to go look for brown? So I don't, I don't really go into it um, with a set plan in mind. I guess I go into it with an idea but I just let the fish tell me what they're doing. I mean, you know, I guess my, my previous thoughts going into this were your small mouth were mixed in with your large mouth and eight to 12 feet around grass. And, and I think that is where a lot of them are. I mean, the elites did stuff similar to that and did really well. Um, but I feel like after that, that time where they transition from the grass, they move out, they start going to these boulders. And um, I think, that's kind of what I stumbled upon. What was that transition from where they moved to the grass, to the boulders. And I'm sure it's different every part of the lake. I mean, that lake can fluctuate 20, 30 degrees, depending on where you're at. So, um, but I feel like in the summertime, I mean, that, that's going to be my go-to is finding all those, those rock piles and stuff like that, you know, and, but I've never been able to consistently catch that many big fish off the rocks either. Right. So you mentioned how in practice, each day you're relocating fish, right? You, it wasn't more of just you're going to keep running spots. You're just going to find where the fish are and see where they're moving. Do you have like a system of relocating these fish? Because I feel like that's something 
you know, guys say, well, we have to go find them again. But, like, it's a lot easier said than done, obviously, especially for a, a nomadic fish like a smallmouth. And is there something, you know, a systematic process that you have to try to find these fish? You know, like, I found them in 20, now they're gone. You know, do you know to go look shallower? What tells you to go look shallower? What tells you to look deeper? You know, what what's kind of your, your mental process when it comes to that? I think the honest answer is I, I, I just don't, you know, this was, this was all <laughs> me. Um, you know, I had never chased fish around like this, you know, I never relocated fish, but you know, you watch these pros on TV and, and I feel like some of the better guys these days are the ones with their, their live sonar and, and utilizing their side imaging and, and regular sonar. And I mean, you look at guys like Patrick Walters and Paul Mueller. I mean, we didn't hear those names that much before live sonar, but those guys took it and, and grasped it and, and learned how to use it. And it's so obvious when you watch it now, Dustin Connell, right? We never heard him before. I, I don't think anyways, but he's up at the top in every MLF event now. And you look at him and he's chasing fish around with a jerk bait. And that's the same thing Patrick Walters is doing. And you know, it's. I think we just have to embrace this live sonar and, and, and just evolve with it, just like we have with everything else, you know, GPS and side imaging. And um, it was certainly a lot harder to, to learn how to use side imaging and down imaging than it was to pick up live sonar for me anyways. Um, but I just feel like, I feel like at this point, I just have it dialed in and I have just a hundred percent confidence in it. I mean, I really, I went out to, to Lake Michigan last year and I'd never been there before. I didn't get any info from anybody. Like I just went out because of COVID I wasn't fishing tournaments and I went out there with my dad and I just said, I'm going to find these fish with my electronics. And a lot of the guys were saying, you know, out there in Traverse city, they were saying it's really tough in the summer. And I just went around until I found them. And when I found them, it was every fish was over five pounds. I wasn't catching a hundred a day, but I was catching 20 to 40 a day and catching 25 to 27 pounds every day. And I got to the point I could mark one with sonar or down imaging and I could literally turn the boat around and catch the fish with active target. And I mean, that just, that just told me everything I needed to know about smallmouth. And it's not always that easy, but. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. that process is simple, but what it takes to execute that process takes a lot of patience and a lot of, like, getting you know, a lot of time behind your screen. There's a lot of not fishing going on, and that that's a huge yeah. thing for me, right? Because I, I, I don't get a lot of time off. I mean, I'm only on the water on weekends and stuff, and, you know, I get a few weeks of vacation a year, but I'm not out there nonstop. So my time is limited on the water, and the last thing I want to be doing is sitting on my butt, you know, riding around graphing, putting a million hours on my motor. But <laughs> I've just learned that if you're going to win, you uh, have to. You have to. You have to learn how to use your electronics and maybe not down south if the fish are up shallow you know we're talking largemouth but if you want to be competitive with small and these are they're different everywhere right you guys out fishing erie and all that i'm sure it's totally different but i mean i went to a, that i think that michigan trip was huge for my confidence i went to somewhere i literally knew nothing about and just slayed them that is awesome trevor city is one i really want to go to it's on the bucket list Oh, I, I, it ruined. Yeah. I thought I was going to retire at Champlain, but no way. Traverse city is where I'm going. <laughs> <laughs> now the well, question so, is, have you been to Buffalo yet? Cause that's a pretty fun place to fish. You, as well. you get me confused. If you start telling me about all these different places, if I can start <laughs> catching five and six pound smallies, I'm just trashed. <laughs> yeah. You got to come here in November. Yeah. That's what I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it's so, silly. When you're on smallmouth and say you're kind of going through a rotation of baits and people say smallmouth are stupid and they are, you know, in nature, they're relatively just opportunistic feeders mean, mean eating machines, yeah. and they're just going to eat about everything. But there are times where these fish aren't going to, they're going to be stubborn. There are certain times when they're going to want something and only that. And if you don't give them that, they're not going to eat it. And there's been times, you know, it happened to me this this past year. I had a tournament on one of our lakes, which is actually a a nine horse and under lake, and but it's known for smallmouth. But they're very nomadic. There's not there's this, it's just a big bowl, so these fish don't have anything to sit on. And I spent the majority of a tournament just trying to find fish to drop on. And at one point, I found a big school of them, and they wouldn't eat it. And I was like, okay, they just these just can't be smallmouth because in my mind, smallmouth are going to eat whatever you put in their face. 
Well, I took my GoPro off of my my mount behind me, and I tied it onto my frog rod, my 65 pound braid, and I dropped it down to the bottom, and they were smallmouth. And I was like, what in the heck? Like, I, my mind was completely spinning at this point. When do you know, when you're on a school like that, that maybe, you know, maybe you haven't had an experience like that before, when to leave a, a school that isn't eating? Um, I, I don't, I would never hang around if I couldn't get bit with the first i don't know 10 15 minutes like if i dropped it in front of you know five or ten different fish and none of them ate it i'd either well i I probably wouldn't leave but i would try something different like i feel like they will bite something um but the problem is can you if we're talking deep here if we're talking you know 20 to 50 feet can you get it in front of them in time to get them to eat it and that's the problem right because there's not so many baits you can get down there that quick i mean you sure you can go bomb a three quarter ounce jig around, but that thing's still going to take a while to fall. And I just feel like the drop shot is the most critical part, but I have switched it up to Ned rigs. I found Ned rigs work great sometimes and when they wouldn't need a drop shot, but I feel like they all, at least on Champlain, they'll always bite something. You just have to figure out what they're in the mood for. That's a good point. They it's always like, that yeah, it's a hard deal. Two D sonar, right? You couldn't, I mean, you had to get on top of them and, they're a totally different fish when you get on top of them. You know, they, they can react completely different. They're definitely more aggressive when they're out in front of the boat than than being underneath you. That's a great point. Andrew, is there anything to add on that, being that you're a smallmouth guy? Oh, I mean, I agree completely. There's times on Lake Erie where I'm going to give some stuff away. You have to almost drift for them. They won't eat when you're on top of them, but we have so many fish in Buffalo but when you drift, you have to long line. So I'm talking like 100, 150, maybe even 200 feet away from the boat. And once you hit a certain point, no matter what the bait is, they eat it. Because they don't feel that boat on top of them anymore. So the most oh. the, to that point that you have there, Andrew, the most interesting thing I saw when I went out to Traverse City was I found an isolated boulder. And it had about a dozen four i mean i don't know how big exactly but i'm guessing they were all five six pounders i mean they were all huge and i drifted over that boulder and no lot i mean i was in 38 feet of water i drifted over that boulder every single one of those smallmouth left that boulder and i couldn't relocate them again like they just disappeared and i was blown away by that and another thing that i found too out there with that i mean that water's way clearer than anything we have here but I found that the smallmouth would actually come up off the bottom slowly as your boat went over them. And I can't tell you how many times I turned around and caught them behind the boat. I don't know why they do that. I don't know what makes them want to bite after the boat goes over them. But it wasn't just like a one-off thing. I mean, I, I caught some six pounders doing that. And that was, I was, it didn't make any sense to me. I'd never seen that before. Yeah. It's funny. Like the first thing I always try to do is drop on them because I want to see how, reactive they are so because i don't have any live scope or 360 i can't really see how to run i run just live i have a live 12 and a live 9 on my boat with just side down imaging in 2d and if i can't get them to eat dropping on them and then i'll try to pitch to them like 30 40 feet from the boat if they don't eat then i go straight to long lining them 100 150 feet away and you can usually get them to eat at that point because i feel like they don't feel that boat pressure right right and i it's cool too on 2d you can almost see them starting to come up as the boat comes over top of them if you look at it correctly so i gotta go grab a uh, cell phone charger real quick i'll be right back you're fine dude it's such an interesting conversation and and like so you mentioned that they rise with it's probably because the shade that the boat casts over those fish i would think right yeah i would think so as well and i mean like this spring too when i was ripping them on blades early on i would tell clients to just keep the bail open until we get way past them because i'm like i can see them come up but they're not chasing the blade like i can see my blade coming up a foot above them and i would see them on 2d literally rise and sit in a water column below the blade and i'm like huh and i was like try long lining them and as soon as we get past them on whatever breeze there was they would double up on that school of fish so I think one of the major proponents is like five, six years ago, you can go out and drop on any single smaller you wanted. But pressure is up so much on all of our lakes, especially last year. Um, I've, 
I personally feel that they're they're not accustomed to boats. They they get weary of boats. So as soon as you get kind of past them, they go back into that hunter instinct. Do you think smallmouth have a shorter term length of memory than largemouth? I I think all bass have a short term memory because their brain is only about ba big, right? So it's not so much that. I think it's just they can. I think all fish can sense when something is not right in their environment. So I mean, Lake Erie is on a good calm week. 25 foot of is you can see the bottom in 25 to 30 foot of water so if you think about this way if it's sunny you got a slight riffle on the water sun penetration is great to the bottom as soon as you get this big black shadow that rolls over top of them i think that would throw me in a funk how many times have you been out in the sun and it's bright sunny blue sky and all of a sudden it gets a little dimmer because that one random cloud comes over the sun and you look up so, like, that's how I feel about the smallmouth. They're like, what is that? And it kind of throws them off a little bit. Interesting. Steve, you got a theory on that? Why those smallmouth rise when they when your boat goes over? I, I, yeah, I mean, I just think they're getting spooked by the shadow coming over them. They're just not used to it. You know, I mean, I, you would think they'd kind of be used to it just from boat traffic. But from what I, I don't know that lake at all. But, I mean, there wasn't many boats out there at all. So. They're, they're probably right. not used to it, especially out, you know, once you get out to that bigger water. Yeah. Interesting conversation, but it's summer smallmouth are so tough, but sometimes like when you get on them, they're so easy to catch and it makes you think like, why is it so hard to freaking dial these things in the summer months? Like there's times when they are the dumbest fish and they are the most fun fish to target. And there's times where they are the most difficult fish to find, difficult fish to target. And it just like drives you nuts. You just want to pull all your hair out of your head. Yeah. But it makes you love them because they're, they're, they're like that. So, But, Steve, I think one thing we want to talk about before we let you go tonight, and uh, first of all, we appreciate you trooping through. We know you're, you're not feeling too well. So, yeah, we appreciate you taking the time out tonight. Um, but one thing we want to mention is you kind of have a cool little deal for us uh, uh, in the Northeast um, when it comes to electronics, there's not a lot of resources for electronics when it comes to us Northeasterners. You know, obviously there's things now uh, in the media, whether it be YouTube, you know, we we're talking about this offline. There's stuff that you can look up on YouTube, read about on the internet, but you know, us, at least in the Northeast, there's beyond your local marina, which maybe you can trust, maybe you can't trust. There's not a lot of resource knowledge and help when it comes to fishing electronics, but you have, uh, your own little business and I would love to hear you kind of tell us more about it and tell the viewers more about it and where they can find it. Yeah. So I have, uh, I started a business a few years ago called uh, bass fishing electronics. We actually started out as bass fishing Two Fifty, which n no thought went into this name to be honest, because of this all came <laughs> about when I created an eBay store. Uh, I, I wanted to make about 500 bucks a month extra just to fund my Champlain addiction. And that, that was really the only reason I started it. And, here we are three years later and i'm really regretting not coming up with a more uh <laughs> creative <laughs> business name but um <clears throat> the cool <clears throat> excuse me the cool part is a uh, guy louis bernardo a local guy he he took my logo and it was it was pretty awful before it was just a big glob of ink with a a fish and a, and a depth finder on there and he redesigned the whole thing and i felt like that was the turning point for the business not not just because of the logo but we had a we had something to identify us at that point that we were proud to show off and put out there and um you know i i, I just kept rolling from i was buying these units on ebay and reselling them is all i was doing used units um and that's really how the whole thing got started and it just kind of snowballed into you know selling five or ten units a month to selling 30 units a month and um, they got to the point where I started to get some attention from some of the people from Lawrence and, and a couple other local guys. And it opened up a whole bunch of new doors to distributors and then eventually going direct with Lawrence. And, you know, now I'm selling almost anything you can think of to do with bass fishing and electronics. I mean, we're not a tackle store or anything, but anything electronics related, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, wire, uh, fish finders, live sonar, trolling motors, um, you know, even accessories, TH Marine stuff, DD26, bass boat technologies, 
I mean, anything that's going to go on a bass boat for a tournament, not even just a tournament guy, just a weekend angler, we, we carry that. And um, I, I take a lot of pride in, in being knowledgeable on that stuff, too. Um, and, and this tournament was, was really, really cool for the business just to show I'm not just some, some guy trying to get rich off of selling fish finders, which obviously I'm not getting rich anyways, but <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not just selling fish finders just to sell fish finders. Like I, I, this is truly a passion of mine and, and, you know, it's been tough balancing the business with fishing because obviously I have to take week, a week off at a time to to go practice and travel. And, you know, that, that gets, I let it get to me sometimes. I hate missing people's phone calls and ignoring messages. It's just not in my blood, but unfortunately that's just part of the business. You know, if I want to learn how to use this stuff and and be competitive with it, I got to get out there and spend the time on the water. And so that this tournament was just so awesome to prove that I'm not just selling them and I can actually, you know, I can use the electronics. And, And that's the sole reason I won this tournament was because of live sonar. There's no, I'm not trying to hide that in any way shape or form i mean it's changed the game for me hmm. um so yeah i mean you can find us uh on bassfishingelectronics.com we got a, a full website set up there I, I designed that website myself so i try to make it just really easy and and uh so you're not clicking through a million things to get to the, the product you want and you know, we're certainly open to any feedback on that. I mean, that was, I have no website experience. So this is just something I did through Shopify. And, um, you know, I've basically just done everything in this business on my own up until recently, my wife, uh, quit her job and she's doing the administrative stuff now. So, and then uh, I'm leaning towards quitting my full-time job as well and, and doing just the fish finder thing. So right now I'm doing it like nine to three, nine to five, however late I can do it. And I have to go into my other job. So, um, you know, we're, we're really excited to see what the future brings. We want to, you know, when, when you guys buy electronics and trolling motors, whatever it is, we want to, we want to, you know, be one of the first ones you think of. Um, and one of the coolest parts that, that kind of gives us an advantage over some businesses just because of where we're located, we're in New Hampshire and we don't charge sales tax and we're not required to. So that's a pretty cool thing. You know, if you're spending six to 10 grand on electronics, it's quite a bit of savings there. So. Heck yeah. I, uh, what I did for anyone listening, um, we're only viewing right now. We have uh, the website posted in the comments so you guys can get to. Um, and Steve's social pages are listed in the description. And for those listening on the MP3, um, it'll that website link will be in the description so you guys can head over and check it out um, and utilize that resource because uh, Steve is obviously extremely knowledgeable. And uh, we're looking forward to getting Steve back on here for uh, – a different little deal that you guys will obviously Andrew and I will kind of fill you in on a little bit more here after Steve leaves us for a second. But uh, uh, we, hopefully we're getting Steve back on and uh, pick his brain more on just fishing electronics. Uh, we're looking forward to that. But Steve, before we let you go, dude, um, and obviously you guys, like I mentioned quick, just go check out his socials and his website. Um, Steve, before we let you go, um, one question we like to ask everybody who's new to the show that we haven't had on. Andrew, I feel like we haven't asked this in oh, a long time. I was just about to say, it's been a very long time since we've asked this question. So, so. yeah, everyone that's new to the show, we ask this question to. It's just kind of been something I, I started from the beginning. <clears throat> um, so if you could sit down, have a beer, have a steak with three different individuals, whether they're alive currently, alive a thousand years ago, whether they're, they don't even have to be the fishing industry. If you just want to sit down, have a beer to steak with three individuals to pick their brain, who are you going to invite? Uh, I'm probably not going to give the right answer without putting a lot of thought into it. But um, <laughs> Well, you're not allowed to have a lot of thought. That's why it's on the spot. So. <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I think Bill Dance would be one of the ones. You know, he, he kind of was in fishing, you know, earlier than just about anybody. Um, and, right. you know, I grow up growing up watching him on tv all the time so i, I think he'd have to be one of the ones okay yeah Bill um, yeah who else man i'm bad getting put on the spot <laughs> uh, aren't we all <laughs> one, of, one of these guys one of these guys that's great with live sonar like patrick walters i think that would be pretty cool to sit down and, and just get on it and have an honest conversation not just the the smooth over you know, I don't really have that conversation with many people on what I what I truly do and the, the little ins and outs of live sonar. So it would be kind of cool to have that conversation with somebody who intimately knows how to use it. Oh, so you're saying you got some juice up there in that <laughs> noggin, huh? 
<laughs> lots and lots of time. Live sonar has been out for three years, right? So I've spent a lot of time staring at that screen on different lakes and different fish. And, you know, there's definitely some little things you pick up over the years. But I, I've been pretty, pretty transparent about all this, you know, through this whole thing. Um, th there's really no big secret. There's just little things you learn what what to look for. <laughs> Well, Steve, I think we're going to have to have you on with a few beers and kind of pick your brain out <laughs> some juice. <laughs> Try to fry some stuff out of you. <laughs> All right. You got Patrick Walters and you got Bill Dance. Who's your third? Uh, any uh, any sport heroes, childhood heroes? No, I mean, growing up, I, I didn't really watch sports. It was all about fishing. Um, That's awesome. Probably... Uh, I don't know who would be one of the guys we looked up to growing up. I I guess, you know, I, I always wondered what it would be like to meet Van Dam, but I didn't have the best experience when I met Van Dam at Lake Michigan. So um, I, I don't know. I don't mm -hmm. know. I, I guess I'd like to pick his brain. He'd probably be one I'd want to talk to. Okay. Kevin Van Dam, Bill Dance, Patrick Walters. It's a good three. I'll be interested to see how Bill Dance manages with forward-facing sonar. <laughs> yeah, I think that might be a thing. That wouldn't be the topic of discussion on that. That's no. <laughs> <laughs> Knowing that's him in the bloopers would probably be like towing motor facing forward and live sonar facing backwards, you know, with his bloopers, and he's just wondering why he can't reach any of the fish. Yeah, I've, I've got, to, <laughs> you know, my, my dad's friends with a lot of guys who have fished for a long time and, and guys who have done really well and had some huge wins and, to see the older generation see this live sonar come in, it's kind of comical because they, they drives them nuts, right? They, yeah. they just can't stand it because it's, it's all about technology and it, it wasn't like that before. You just had to put your head down and learn how to be a good fisherman. And that's only part of it at this point, you know? Right. That's true. And there's a lot more variables now as time goes on, things are going to advance and you're going to have to get good at everything because if you don't get with the times, somebody else will, and they're going to whoop up on you. And that's just well, that that one you know, that, 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 that that guy found on his Lawrence flasher, you know, 30 years ago that nobody in the world knew about because there wasn't any such thing as contours and, you know, down imaging and side imaging. You know, that that's all a thing of the past. It, I kind of got to see that a little bit when I moved down to Alabama for a couple of years. I, I met an older guy down there. and. He, he spent more time on that lake than, than probably just about anybody. And he was so secretive about some of the stumps and stuff he had. And, and we started fishing together a little bit. And I would take him to these spots. And he's like, hey, hey, how, what, how do you know about this? And I'm like, uh, it's called side imaging. Like, and there's, no, there's no secrets anymore. We all have contours. We all have side imaging. There's literally nowhere the fish can hide anymore. You know? Yeah. It's just up to you and how much work you're willing to put in. And that's mm -hmm. what it's all about. That time behind the steering wheel and being learned, you know, willing to learn those electronics that, that you could, you know, there's no end at that point. You can do whatever you want with it. It's all about time on the water. That's a fact. Yeah. But I think it's a, it's a huge thing too, that we grew up, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to grow up fishing at a young age before we had all that. And I think that helped develop my skills as a fisherman because we never did rely on any of that stuff. I mean, when I first started fishing Champlain, I didn't have GPS and it wasn't that, uh, it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it, it, the yeah. sport has changed a ton in the last five, six, seven years, whatever it's been. Right. Yeah. Well, Steve, is there anything you'd like the folks to know, the folks to know or anybody you want to shout out before uh, we let you go here? No, if you just check us out on online, check out our website, uh, like us on Instagram and Facebook. We, we do a lot of stuff on Facebook. Not, not, I'm not as good with Instagram, but, uh, you know, we're always posting sales and stuff like that. And, um, you know, any feedback you guys have for me too, that it's all, I'm open to all of it. So. Thank awesome. you. Well, dude, obviously we hope you feel better. We appreciate yeah. you trooping through Thank for you. us tonight. It was a uh, pleasure to talk with you and we look forward to, getting you back on here and chatting with you and diving more into uh, fishing electronics. Sounds good, guys. I appreciate you having me on. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Take care, man. Have Good a good night. All right, see you. Bass fishing electronics, the topic that everyone is diving into now and it's become a topic for discussion, debate, argument, hate, love. Uh, it's, just, it's 
it's kind of interesting to see different demographics and how they react to fishing electronics. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I still abide by the motto of if you hate forward facing sonar, it's because you haven't used it because it's a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, absolutely. I just don't want to pay for it. That's my issue. <laughs> yeah. So, like, yeah, dude, it's not, I was thinking about it earlier. It's kind of interesting. So, if you think about like the economy and kind of like what thing we talked about this a little bit on the boat this past weekend, it's like with the way gas is going, if gas dies out and like, I wonder how. If no one's like making an electric motor, that's gonna affect one boat companies, electronics companies. It'll make kayak fishing more relevant. It's it's gonna be interesting to see who kind of translates over to electric. W will you see an electric outboard in the next five ten years? The way lithium batteries are going, yes. You think? Do you think there's one that can compete with? Say a 250 Merc right now that can keep up speed wise, efficiency, uh, lasting, you know, a whole eight, nine hour tournament day. That's the biggest issue um, is the sustainability of it over a full day tournament, right? Like if you look at a Tesla that runs on a lithium battery, you might only get four to five hours of drive time on it. And that's a Tesla. It's a full-blown automobile. I would think if the technology was right in five to ten years, you could for surely see electric outboard motors in that 250 class range. And the biggest thing that people don't realize is electrical current actually puts out more power usually than combustion in fuel and gas and oil. So the Tesla is a rocket ship on land. That thing goes zero to 60 as fast as like any other car because it's so much lighter. So it's, it'll be very interesting. Wouldn't have to worry about filling up. That's true. I mean, that's my biggest issue with the boat, right? Is putting a hundred dollars of gas in it every time I have to go fishing, if not more. So it's, it's not I wonder if it would make boats more affordable. Probably not, because you're going to have to pay for the technology on the motor. Do you think, like, if gas ever dies out, that the boats' will prices will just rise with the motors? Correct. Same way with cars. As soon as they get rid of gas on gas cars, we're going to see electric car prices shoot through the roof because it's supply and demand. They can't build electric cars as fast as they can build an old combustion engine. Hmm. Yeah, what because, was gas at the ramp when you got it? Or when you were got to get it? It was like, what, 419? 408. It wasn't that bad. 408. 408. It wasn't There's that no bad. It's 408, dude. <laughs> dude, so I want to say before gas prices got out of control, I had an afternoon uh, fishing trip on Erie, and I had to get gas before we ran out because I was rushing from Lake. I believe I paid 459 at Safe Harbor. For gas. Yeah, I put 50 bucks in. And I got off the water. I went to the gas station. That was like a straight over after I pulled out. And I think I paid like 340 for it. <laughs> like, it was just, I needed it for that night. And I had a $50 bill. And I just like throw 50 in it. <laughs> what the heck? Brutal. Good grief. Well, for folks who are still tuning in and folks who are listening right now, one, we appreciate you guys still sticking around. Uh, but we have some massive news coming this week. Uh, it's not news we're going to tell you right now, but we're going to give you a hint. And it's that the Serious Angler fam, the uh, the Serious Angler brand is growing. So we are going to, I will drop, I'll let you have this bit of info. The rest of it will come out this week. Um, and it is that we are now going back to three episodes a week. We will have a Wednesday show. And that is about all we're going to let you in on now and all i'm gonna say there's gonna be more hints that we're gonna drop from now until wednesday so you guys gotta tune in to our uh, social media make sure you guys follow us on instagram and facebook uh we're gonna be adding a pretty cool deal uh for a new episode per week uh we're growing this brand it's gonna be a huge step in the right direction to taking the show to new heights and hopefully getting you guys more content and better content we really know everyone likes when we had three episodes a week and we wanted to, but obviously with our time, you know, Andrew and I couldn't do that 
Um, you know, it's hard enough right now with both having full-time jobs and you're the family. I'm trying to move in less than two weeks. Uh, getting back to three episodes was out of the picture. Two episodes enough as, as difficult as it is right now. But we do it because we love it. But now with what we're going to do here, we're going to be able to have three shows a week. And we're really excited to uh, to add this to the show. And that's about all I can give right now. Yeah. Obviously, we'll have more details for you guys. Uh, one Once that will come out, on well, I think we'll announce it on Wednesday. And then what we'll do is we'll have a whole show uh on Friday, detailing everything for you guys, catch you guys up on what the plan is, what's going to happen moving forward. Uh, but we're beyond excited. So thank you guys for your support to lead us up to this point. And uh, we're pretty excited to see what's going to happen with this deal. And we're excited to get to Mr. Steve Estes back on the show yep. because this is directly in line with what we're going to be doing with this show and its expansion. So we appreciate all. We appreciate everyone who's constantly on this show. You know, like Mr. Warren Beard commenting right now. He said he can't wait to see what's coming up. Warren, we appreciate you. Uh, he's one of the guys that's always on these shows, always tunes in Monday Night Live. We appreciate you all, especially if you're someone that's always listening to the MP3 podcast deal from a, a audio format. We appreciate the hell out of all of you who are consistent listeners. It means the world to us, and you guys are the reason why we keep doing this thing. Um, so we appreciate you. Andy, anything else to add before uh, we hop off here? No, um, thanks. Oh, I'm going to um, race back here a little bit. I want to say thank you to everybody to, that came back after we've taken a couple like random breaks here and there this summer mm -hmm. due to the complications of our schedules that we have. It should become easier. So thank you for bearing with us. Um, it is mine and Bailey's utmost importance is to try and get two episodes out a week, plus put uh, YouTube content out there for your videos for you guys to enjoy. It's just some weeks, it's a little hectic and tough, so that's why we have this big announcement coming is to make everything easier also yeah. for us. And this, so, you know, obviously we've been really bad lately about putting out fishing videos. I'm literally going to finish editing a video after this Monday Night Live. Uh, so hopefully there will be a fishing video tomorrow. Should be a kayak top water deal. Um, but this expansion of the show, you know, with my new job, I'm going to be on the road a lot, which might mean it might be complicated for me to join in on Monday Night Lives or Friday's episodes. This addition will hopefully help provide to keep a Monday Night Live show flowing and ready, even if I'm not even there. Uh, so that's what's going to be pretty cool about it. And uh, hopefully that's kind of another little hint for you guys. Uh, at what's coming. So, um, but Andrew, I think without further ado, because if I keep rambling, I'm probably going to just leak it. So I think we might as well end we it here. Sign off, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, hopefully, appreciate all you guys. Uh, keep tuning in. If you guys listen on the audio side, we really appreciate. If you are listening uh, on a platform like Apple Podcast that allows you guys to leave a rating and review. Uh, please leave that uh, down in the show details. We appreciate it in the, uh, from everybody, whether they're good or bad. We, we appreciate the honesty. So without further ado, that's going to be it. We'll see you guys on Friday. <laughs>